you mute it? Okay. I'm sorry? Were you muted? Have you muted your phone? Well, I just star six. Okay. Yes, you, you have muted. Okay. Okay, there you go. So just star, star six again to mute yourself back out. That's what I need to know. Once again, Lord, we say thank you. Uh, God, thank you for this day. Lord, just thank you for the opportunity to say thank you. Uh, Lord, thank you for um, allowing us to stand uh, in your presence, to um, stand and study your word, and to give back um, what you've given me in study time. Uh, Lord, I pray this morning for open hearts and minds uh, that we may be able to understand what your word is saying to us, but that we may be encouraged by the word, uh, that we will know what it really means that prayer will get us there. And so, Lord, I ask God that you would um, remove the nervousness, that you would uh, do what you do, that you would speak through me, speak for me, speak to these, your sisters, God. Lord, I thank you for who you are in each of our lives. Lord, I thank you for meeting us where we are. In Jesus' name, I So, prayer will get you there. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Um, like I said, you have plenty of white space on your handout. As you can see, it was pretty simple. So when you, you want to take notes, write down questions or whatever, feel free. You've got plenty of paper to do so. So, let's dive in. Now, the theme of the book of Luke is to present Jesus as the Son of Man. And so Luke 18 is linked to the previous eschatological discourse in chapter 17 by the reference made in verse 8 to the Son of Man. So what we're going to do before I go there, let's, let me pause a minute, and I'm going to read to you those verses first, and then we'll jump back. So chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was a certain city, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will, will he really find faith on the earth? So, like I was saying, uh, when we look back to previous chapters, Jesus is telling parables that is leading up to the point of where we're going to study this morning. So let me take you back a few chapters and give you an overview on what has already taken place. So if you flip back to chapter 14, flip back in your scriptures, paper Bibles, or scroll back if you're using an electronic chapter 14 uh, starting at verse 25 basically teaches Jesus is teaching his disciples about the cost of being a disciple basically he's saying in a nutshell you must forsake all if you're going to follow me 
That's in chapter 14. Chapter 15 is he is in the three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Jesus taught that people were more important than money and things, while the Pharisees put more value on money and things. Okay? Jesus is teaching people are more important than money and things. Pharisees were putting were putting more value on money and things. Then when he gets to chapter 16, Jesus is teaching the parable of the unjust servant. Uh, money is not to be our master. So he was teaching about the right use of money. He's telling the story about the rich man and Lazarus confronting the Pharisees again regarding the ultimate destiny of heaven or hell. Chapter 17, bringing you up. The focus of Jesus' teaching here is he's centering on his disciples and he's teaching on offenses in verses 1 through 10. Uh, then he teaches on the second coming where he will physically rule in the kingdom of God. So now up to this point, we see Jesus is demonstrating authority over demons, diseases, and death. His ministry of preaching, healing, and, dis and discipling has been widespread. However, the rejection of Jewish leaders towards the Son of Man has now increased. So, now in the midst of all of this, though, that's going on, like I said in those previous chapters, in the midst of that, there's a group who is coming to him, those who are considered outcast by the Pharisees, because remember now, the Pharisees were self-righteous. So in chapter 18, where we, which is going to be our study for today, Jesus is teaching another parable, and this time, his subject is prayer. He gives instructions to his disciples on what to do while waiting for his second coming. Because, again, he's tying back. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Back to the end of chapter 17 is why he's now talking about prayer. So basically what he tells them is since y'all know I'm coming back, but y'all don't know when, y'all don't know what it's going to be, y'all don't know what the future is, this is what you're to do in the meantime while you are waiting. You are to pray. And while I was saying this, I started thinking about even where we are. It's almost like got up one day and we heard a briefing in the news about there was a allergy. I don't even know it was an allergy. There was something in the air. And that's how it started. I don't even remember how it started now. It's been so long. We're now in this pandemic. So however that started, it's like we had this headline that there was something going on and then all of a sudden now, months and months later, we're here. We don't know when it started and we definitely have no, well we kind of when it started, but we definitely have no idea when it's going to end. Because when it first happened, we're thinking, you know, a day or two, a couple weeks, maybe a month. Now it's almost a whole year. And so we it's clear, unless, again, God does something miraculous between now and the end of the year, it's clear in my mind this is not going away in 2020. So because we don't know when it's going to stop, we don't know, even know how, just like Jesus is telling, his fair, telling the disciples, what do we do while we wait? We pray. That's what we do. We pray. So we look at a parable. A parable basically is a spiritual st story cast alongside earthly life. So it's basically a sample of what's really going on, what's happening in earthly life. All right. So what's amazing about Jesus t telling this parable about prayer is that prayer is one of the things that Jesus was about. You and I, when we think about Jesus, we would think, you know, he's God of the universe. So why would Jesus need to pray? But he does. And he set some examples of when he prayed. In Matthew uh, 14 and 23, Jesus, Jesus sought some time uh, to pray, sought some time alone to pray. Um, I guess we could go back to it. I need some more info this morning. It's like, hold on a minute. Let's see. Matthew 14 and 23 tells us, And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when he then had come, he was alone there. Again, see, he sought some time to pray by himself. Mark 1 and 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long time, while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. Again, Jesus rising up early in the morning to pray. When we get to Luke 6. he rises up early in the morning. Now the scripture tells us he spent the whole night in prayer. This, this, is, this is Jesus, y'all. Yeah. So imagine if that's Jesus, what we need to do. Luke 22, 41 and 42. 
22 tells us, and he was withdrawn from them from about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He, he was praying because he was preparing for his suffering by prayer. So again, if Jesus had to pray, what, what about us? So today, uh, this parable is, te is a teaching from God himself to pray and not to lose heart. So we're going to see in this, in this passage uh, Jesus' exhortation to pray. We're going to see his example of prayer, and then we're going to see his encouragement for prayer. So, in uh, verse 1, again, I will re re read it one more time. Then, he's, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So now in this parable by prayer, Jesus is contrasting, not comparing the selfish judge and the heavenly father. This parable is unique to Luke because it shows that he was making an immediate application of Jesus' prophecy, again, that was told in chapter 17, the readiness for his return will be conditioned by prayer. Basically, I'm coming back, but you ought to be making ready by praying. So he concludes in chapter 17 with a discord on the last days and the fact that he would be coming again, like I said, the second coming, and he likened those days to the days of Noah and Lot, that they would be difficult days, days that they would not be conducive to faith. Jesus did not say exactly when the second coming would occur, but clearly it would happen. Clearly it is going to occur. It would be sudden and unexpected by most people who are still alive then, and no one will be able to miss it when it occurs. So now what, he, what he's doing, he's continuing instruction to the disciples about his return. He tells them in this parable to encourage them to continue praying while they live out the time before his second coming. Okay, Remember, this is a spiritual story cast alongside earthly life. Jesus tells his disciples, in the meantime, what I need you to do is pray. He wanted to encourage them to continue praying and not to grow discouraged. Now, in verse 1, when he says, men are to always pray. When you think about always, always means being necessary to pray. When necessary, that's what you do, you pray. Always indicates the interval of time between Jesus' present ministry and his future return that was in view. So when he says men are to always pray, he says it's necessary that you pray. But when you say, when he says, when you, when you look at the word ought in the original language, it means it's a must, it's imperative. He's not suggesting it, he's saying it is a must that you pray, you have to. You must certainly play, pray at all times. It is inevitable for you to pray. But when should men pray? Always. Scripture says, and when he spoke a prayer to them, that men, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. When should they pray? Always. When it's necessary. So when is it necessary? Always. Okay? Don't miss that. He says men, all, always, men always ought to pray. When? When it's necessary. When is it necessary? Always. Okay? Which means men ought to always pray because it's always necessary. There's never a time that prayer is, you know, oh, okay, I have nothing else to do, so, mm, okay, yeah, maybe. I'll. No, we ought to always pray. And why? The B clause of that verse says, so we don't lose heart. That's he tell, he tells that you ought to always pray. Always pray when it's necessary. So when it's necessary, it's always. And we, and the reason you do that is so that you don't lose heart. Because if you do, you're going to grow discouraged. That's what he means when he says don't lose heart. You will faint, and you're going to grow discouraged. You think about us even in our own lives. If, even people that we know, you can tell when somebody is not in sync with God. Things are not going well, and the, and the last thing they want to talk about is God. The last thing they compare uh, to is God. If I pray to God, since I pray to God, I feel so much better. Since I pray to God, my mind is in a different place. But when I don't do that, and we say it all the time, my flesh takes over, and I start thinking about anything and everything that is not equal to what God says. It, doesn't, it goes with the word of God. So the reason we need to pray is because if we don't, we're going to start doing some crazy things and saying some crazy things that don't match the lifestyle that God has gifted us. If we say the, God, the Holy Spirit lives in us and things happen, that says when things don't go the way I think they should, like now, we need to pray. Because if we don't, we're going to complain, we're going to fuss, we're going to be upset, but it's not going to change anything, just like now. All of a sudden, it's been, well, in some areas, uh, it's been lifted. 
go to a restaurant, or you could go here, or you could go there, or whatever the case may be. And so because there are some people who are anxious, anxious to get out, even when you go out, now you've been locked in all this time because you, you should have been locked in for a while. So anyway, so now you've made a choice to go out because that's what you've been wanting to do. But now that you're out, oh, but now that you're out, now, but now that you're out, even with that, I passed the other day and I saw there was a line of people waiting to get into a restaurant. And they were standing outside with, you know, the things like back in the day when it's a waiting and you got to be called. And I thought, okay, first of all, I'm not one of those who ready to get out. I'm good. But what I'm not going to do is get out for the first time and stand in line outside at a restaurant to be caught. It's not, to ha not for me. And so I'm looking, and I'm looking at these people because somebody, I guarantee you, in that line is complaining about them having to wait to be called to go inside because the mind is not right. You want to get, but we want everything to be the way we want it to be. We want it to be right, what we think is right. So I've been inside. I want to go, and I want to go to the restaurant. I want to get the nice waitress or waiter, and I want them to take my order. And I want everything to come back right, and usually it doesn't because nothing has changed because you're still people. You're still dealing with people, and things happen. But if your mind is not right, if we are not praying as we should, then again, our thoughts are not going to be like they should be. And the things that we say are not going to be like as they should as they should be. So we have to pray so that we don't lose heart. Because when you give up on God, like I said, you start doing crazy things, you start saying crazy things, you start talking as one who is not saved, one who is not a believer. So again, the word faint describes a believer who loses heart and gets so discouraged that he or she wants to quit. And we on this journey and there is no quitting. There is no quitting. God says we must always pray. But what is prayer? Prayer is just speaking, communicating with God. It's just talking to God. In its purest, simplest sense, prayer is having a conversation with God. We don't have to be so eloquent that I did I use the right subject? Did my subject and my verb match? Am I using an adjective here or an adverb? God is God knows our heart and he just wants us to talk to him. I don't have to pray like Judy or Lena or Sister Edward or Chanel or Gail or Pam or Sienna. All God wants me to do is talk to him. He says, talk to him. Talk. I can say to God, Lord, I am sad. I am feeling sad today. Lord, my heart is heavy today. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I lift you up. Lord, you are awesome. Lord, today I need you to guide me because I know when I walk through this door, something is going to tempt me, Lord, and I need to be able to call your word back to me that you have promised me, Lord, so that I can be pleasing to you. That he just wants to talk to him. Just talk to him. Nothing fancy. We don't have to be able, you know, I, I remember years ago, many, many years ago, I think when I first came to Good Shepherd, that's, ooh, that's been 30 years, that's a lot. Anyway, a lot of you, how many years have you been married? 30, ooh, over 30 years ago, Wow, we? Okay, so when I first came to Good Shepherd, I would hear Brother Edward pray. And so Brother Edward prays, and you know, he has the sing song chat. And so in my head, like, I, I don't sing to the Lord. So, you know, I can't pray like that. But the Lord didn't call me to sing to, sing to him or pray to him like Brother Edward does. The Lord says he just wants us to talk to him. He wants us to communicate with him because he's going to hear our prayer. There is a connection between verse 1, like I said, and, and verse 37 of chapter 17. Um, 17, chapter 17 of Luke, verse 37 says, And when they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles, there the eagles will be gathered together. The reference here is that if society is like a rotting corpse, then the atmosphere in which we live is being slowly polluted, and this is bound to affect our spiritual lives. But when we pray, we draw on the pure air of heaven, and this keeps us from fainting. Again, the command is always to pray because it's relational. Just as we would continue to converse with someone who is close to us, the command to pray should reflect every element in our lives because God wants us to pray. Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always, always, always with our prayer and supplication in the spirit. First Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us to pray without ceasing. Always pray. Second Thessalonians,
Thessalonians 1.11 says, Therefore, we also pray always for you. Always. Notice there. Always. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Praying without ceasing. Always to pray. Amen. Therefore, also pray always, always for you. When a men to pray? When it's necessary. When is it necessary? Always. When Paul commands us to always pray or to pray without ceasing, he doesn't expect us to walk around with our eyes closed and we murmuring words, nor does he mean endless repetition, nor does he mean prayer should last an hour or two hours. That's not what he's saying. Jesus warned us against those kinds of prayer because in Matthew 6, I'm going to read it for y'all today. I'm going to have y'all to read to me. I don't have a mic, but I'm going to read it for y'all. Matthew 6, 5 and through 8 says, and I need some glasses. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Yeah. But when you pray, but you, yeah. when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Yeah. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Again, don't miss that. Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask. So here he's probably saying again, you are not to walk around, eyes closed, call attention to yourself, praying long. He says, and you are not to pray like these repetitive prayers because, because the, they, were, they were praying like hypocrites. Because remember, the Pharisees thought they were bigger and better than everybody, all right? Basically, prayer, what he's saying is, should be as natural to us as our regular breathing. Unless we're sick or choking or whatever, or feel like we're smothering, we don't give a whole lot of thought to, to us breathing. It's just natural. It just it just comes out. That's what our prayer life should be like. Likewise, is how we should be praying. It should be a natural habit for us. We should be in constant communion with God. I don't have to wait and get home and find whatever that place is in my home that I pray. I don't have to wait till I get home to get to that spot before I can pray. I can pray while I'm in my car. I can pray when I'm in my shower. I can pray when I'm in my own private yeah, okay. I can pray at any time when I'm walking, I'm in the grocery store. Um, I can be on a Zoom call, and that's a lot of times I've been praying on Zoom calls. I don't have to be verbally saying the words, but I can because God knows my heart. So I can pray. God knows what I'm saying. He knows my thoughts. So don't think that we've got to be in a certain spot or I want everybody to see it. Here. No, God says that's not the kind of praying I'm talking about. He warned against that. He says it should be constant commune with God and it'll be a natural habit for us. Amen. Okay. Uh, he, uh, John MacArthur made a point that uh, praying in, inhaling and exhaling is so natural for us that it seems almost involuntary. Un, involuntary. But think about when we hold our, br our breath. Uh, breathing is more natural for us than when we're holding our breath. I think when you go to the doctor and they say, you know, they do an x-ray and they say, uh, you know, hold your breath. And for me, it seems like every time they say, hold your breath, is the time I can't. You just hold your breath. I'm like, when are they going to say release? I'm like, oh. okay, you can release. I'm like, boo, I already released. I can't hold my breath that long because I'm thinking about trying to do something that's not natural for me. Natural says, I just constantly breathe. That's what we do. That's what God is saying for us. Just like we constantly breathe, just like it's natural for us to do, we are to be naturally just praying. Okay. Um, the natural human tendency in continual prayer is to wonder if God is listening. Does he care? But prayer is much more than the words of our lips. It's the desires of our hearts, and our hearts should be constantly desiring before him even if we never speak a word. So to pray without ceasing means to have such holy desires in our hearts, in the will of God, that we are constantly in loving communion with the Father, petitioning him for his blessing and believing that he will answer. Because when you pray, you ought to already believe it done. Because the word tells us that when you pray, you go before the Father, you pray believing it done. 
Because if you're going to God and you're praying and saying, okay, Lord, I know you're not, okay, it's, I know it's not going to happen, but I'm just going to go ahead and pray. Really? I mean, why should he even honor that? You know, think, why should he, I, just, I, I think about me with my, my daddy. I mean, even at my age, I'm still a daddy's girl, and it's just what it is. But I remember as a little girl, when it's something I want, I didn't go to him saying, I know you're not going to get this to me, but I'm going to go and ask you. No, I went believing it was already done because I knew he was going to do it. So if I believe that about my own earthly father, what about my heavenly father? When I pray to him, I got to go with some boldness to him because he owns everything. And if I believe that, I got to go pray and believe it, it's already done. So now what happens is he's teaching about uh, this, this uh, righteous judge, or well, unrighteous judge. So now you have Roman number two, example of prayer. And so that's going to be in verses 2 through 6. So uh, the scripture says, I'll read one again, but 2 through 6. So uh, then he spoke a parable to them that me and I always pray and not lose heart, saying, there was, a cert there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man, nor was there a widow. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. Okay, we're going to stop there. So it continues in verse 2. That, like I say, there's a judge. This judge, he didn't fear. He doesn't fear God, nor he has any regard for man. And then verse 3 tells us, well, I'm, so then verse 3 tells us uh, this widow. Now there's a widow in the city, and she's coming to him. So imagine that. He's unjust. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't regard man. And now this widow comes to him asking him to avenge her of her adversary. So we don't know. It said that we don't know if the judge was a Jewish or a Roman judge. It's unclear, and it's basically irrelevant. In the view of the access, this widow had to, to her presence. It seems, though, that this judge is probably a lower court ju judge, uh, a, lower, a lower official, rather than a Supreme Court, for her to be able just to go to him. All right. Now, you look at the contrast here. You've got a judge. This judge is wicked. He, he is not given a symbol, uh, a symbol of God. Basically, he is uh, in contrast to God. He's unmoved by the validity of the widow's case, okay? The fact that she's being treated unjustly, what they said in verse five. She comes to him because she says, I, I will avenge. He knows this, I'm sorry, verse five says, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. So he knows something is going on, all right? So he's unmoved by her validity of the case, because she definitely has a case. He's crooked, he's unrighteous, he's unfair, he's disrespectful, he's uncaring, and he's preoccupied with his own personal matters. Now you look at the widow. She's a woman. She had little standing before her for the law because she's considered a lower place in society as a widow. Because she's a widow, she has no husband to stand with her in court. And finally, she was treated unjustly. See the contrast so far. All right. Now, in, the, in that day and time, widows, um, like I said, they had a difficult time making ends meet because they had no husband. They had no man to provide for them. So, but in spite of that, God took care. God instructed people to take care of them. Um, see, this isn't something I didn't let y'all read. I gotta, okay, let me flip here again. Um, ex, okay, through this. Somebody, y'all have to read loud. Someone turn to Psalms 146.9, please. And then another person go to Isaiah 1 verses 16 through 17. Psalms 146, 9, and Isaiah 1, 16 through 17.
17. Is it 17? Yes, yes, thank you. So in, bo in, in both of those uh, um, cross-reference passages, you see that God is instructing people to take care of the widow because the widows were important to him. Note, like I said, with the, a, a widow in that day and time, she's left on her own. She has no social insurance. She basically has nothing. There's nothing, anyone, she has nobody to, uh, to support her, no one to stand up for her because, again, she is a woman on her own. And then think about, she has no support, and now she's faced with a judge who is dishonest. Imagine that makes everything all the worse. But the one thing this widow has is persistence. Don't y'all miss that. The one thing she has is persistence. Because verse 3 says, she came to him saying, avenge me of my adversary. In the Greek, when it talks, when it says came, the Greek tense says it's an imperfect tense, which implies she kept coming. She kept appearing frequently before the judge. She kept coming over and over and over again. She came positionally, she came purposefully, and she came persistently. She was not going away. She knew all she had was what she had, which was her to go. She knew she had a case. She knew the judge was, un was unrighteous, but what she knew is that I'm going to still keep going to this judge because if I don't plead my case, kind of like I said, when we go to God, we got to go to God believing it already done. If I don't plead my case, how am I going to get help? So she goes again and again and again. Persistence. She's asking him, she says, I need you to avenge me of my adversary. Basically, get justice. Get Now, the scripture doesn't tell us what the what the uh, what she need to be avenged of? She didn't tell us what her problem was. We don't know. Uh, like I said, what the issue was, why she was asking. All we know, based on the words, that she had been wronged, and she wanted him to avenge her of the wrong that had been committed to her. But think about her. Like I said, she came positionally. She came purposefully. She came persistently. I thought about that as well too. And y'all heard Pastor announce this morning about um, Sister Addison. When we got word on last Sunday that things were, were turning, that her breathing, Pastor called a, a meeting, says that we need to come together at this time, Sunday at 6.30, and let's pray because we've got a, we've got a sister who is, you know, not, the doctors are saying things are not looking good. Her breathing is turning for the worse. So we need to come together and pray. Think about it, y'all. We came together positionally. We came together purposefully to pray for her, and we were persistently praying on that prayer call. And look what God did less than a week later when we go to him again and again and again. We didn't go at different times. We all came together at that one point positionally and purposely praying for sister. Look what God would do because we came to him praying and believing it already done. So just like this lady, she now goes, and imagine, she's going to an unrighteous judge, y'all. She didn't lose heart and say, this man is not going to hear me. I know he's not. No, what she did, she came to him in it because what she knew is that she had been wrong. And he's the only, that's the only place she can go. I got to go to him and I got to ask him to get a vent, to get uh, justice for me. So, um. Basically, what she was saying to him is my rights were being violated. She's asking, the message, the message Bible says, my rights are being violated. Protect me. That's what she's asking. I need protections from you. Widows, like I say, were the personification of dependence, helplessness, and vulnerability in Israel. Okay? However, Luke mentions widows more than any other gospel writers combined. You see... Um, in, in where we are now in chapter 7, we, I think most of us know uh, the story of the widow of Nain when, when God raised her son. I mean, basically, she was going to bury him, and God touches the casket, basically, and he sits up, and she raises, he raises her son. Uh, in chapter 21 is the story of the widow giving her two mites, the last she had. This middle, again, she's by herself. She has nobody here. She has nothing, and she's giving the last two 
mites, her last penance of what she, what she owns, she's giving it to God, all she had. And so think about it. When you think about widows, that's like they, had, they had nothing. They had no one to help them. And a lot of times we think about widows being older people, older ladies, older women, but that may not have even been the case because remember in that culture, you had uh, women married at 13 and 14 years old. So she could have been a young person, but the fact is she was still alone. Yeah. Now, don't get it twisted when we talk about this. I know I keep talking about going to the judge and, we, and she's going to keep going to him. She's going to keep asking him. This parable is not urging us to, to pester God. That's not a such thing. We don't pester God until he acts. Basically what it's telling us, like I said, is that we need to pray. We need, he already knows, but it, it, the word tells us we need to pray to God because he's ready and willing to hear our prayer. He's ready and willing to answer our prayers. Very different than this judge. All right. Now, contrast again. The widow had no lawyer, but we have a high priest at the throne of God in heaven that we can go to at any time, any, any time, as much as we want, as often as we want. She had no promises, but we have a Bible filled with promises that we can claim. Whenever we go to God, we, we get, because God, when we pray to him, we, he wants us to give back. We even got to think about what to say. God says, give me back what I've already given you. Give me back my promises. I've already promised you if you pray, Give me, ba- you ain't got to think, okay, Lord, what am I going to say? Lord, I don't know what, because I think a lot of times we start trying to come up with, um, okay, how do I put it in words, and, you know, how do I make, no, make it plain by giving him back his own word. That's what he tells us. When we are wrong, he tells us to come to him, he said, confess your sins. Conf- call those things exactly what it is. He said, confess it to me, I'm going to, I promise you that. I promise you I'm going to be. He tells, he said, cast your cares on me. That's his word because I care for you. That's God's promise. That's what he wants us to do. So, again, she was an outsider. But who are we? We're children of God. We, he knows who we are. He knows my name. So I can go to God and pray to him at any time because he knows who I am. I mean, we got to think about what it is to have that relationship, to have that connection with God. Because we need to look at being able to go to God and pray to him as a privilege. What a privilege it is to be able to go and talk to God. I can call my girlfriend and talk to her all day, all day long, every day, whatever, and that's all fine and good. But she can't do me like, the, like God can do me. So while I'm doing all of my time talking to my friend, maybe I need to spend more time talking to God. Because I know who he is. I know, what he, I know what he can do for me. I know what he's done for me. Just the fact that he chose to save me is yeah. enough in and, in and of itself. We're not like the widow. We're not abandoned because God is there for us. Ephesians 1, 4 says that we are adopted sons and daughters of God that he chose before the creation of the world. One, I pray to God who chose us before the creation of the world adopted us even knowing how thrown off I was going to be on my good day, how even knowing I was not going to always do what he told me to do based on his word, but he still chose me before the creation of the world because he already knew. He, he already knew, and he made the mold for Marseille. He already knew what I was going to do, what I was going to be like, what I was going to look like, what I was going to say, not say, when I was going to obey, when I wasn't going to obey. He knew it, but he still chose to 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 create me, he still chose me before the creation of the world and adopted me as his daughter. We also have a relationship with God by our baptism. Again, he know, like I said, he knows my name. We are, we are his. So we don't have to bang on heaven's door because Ephesians 4, 16 tells us to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Like I said, when we go to God, we are going to God praying that it is already done. So the widow now, she kept, she kept asking, she kept re, uh, uh, asking repeatedly for protection from those who opposed her. Again, I'm going to repeat verse 3 again. Now there was a widow in the city that she came to him saying, avenge me of my adversary. Again, she kept coming again and again and again. Again, avenge is something that others do to us. Revenge is something that you do on your own. So when she says avenge me, 
<coughs> excuse me, it's not a request for punishment of her adversary, but a decree that she would like protection from her injustices. So she's going to the judge because she's just saying, I've been wrong and I need protection. I don't have a man to stand with me. I don't have a husband. So I need you to help me. I need protection. And then verse 4 says, and he would not. Now imagine, this lady is coming to him again and again, pleading her case. He knows she has a case. And then immediately we hear, and he would not. And then for a while, not, you know, he would not for today. For a while to me sounds like that's time. Yeah. When you say to me for a while, that's like, that wasn't like, okay, I came to you at 6 a.m. today, but a while is going to be 3 or 3 p.m. today. No, a while says to me, that's some days before. Yeah. So he says, and he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God, nor regard man, but look at his reason. Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her co continual coming she weary me. Okay. Now again, this basically he would not basically expresses his state of mind rather than, his, than a single act, I guess. So now his mind says she's on his nerves. Uh, she doesn't really care. Remember, he doesn't fear God. Uh, he has no regard for man. But because she's troubling him, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avenge her because she's going to weary me. Now, weary here does not mean to make tired, okay? Uh, it basically means to cause great annoyance or to wear someone out. Basically, this this woman is saying in order he's basically saying in order that she may keep that she may not keep on coming and in the end wear me out by annoying me. Uh, the Greek translation says uh, that she that she doesn't eventually come and slap my face. I took over so much. It says uh, and basically it, and it was detailed. It says in the area right under the eye to strike under the eye to give one a black eye. Basically, it means to strike someone on the face, under the eyes, in such a way that he gets a black eye and is disfigured as a result. <laughs> like, okay then. So basically, this is a descript description of a woman driven to desperation because she is so busy, she's coming to him again and again and again. His mind is saying, he, she is wearing man. If I don't answer her, it, I might just end up with a, in the sick. Not figuratively, yeah. or not literally, but figuratively. Okay, I may end up with a black eye. So basically, the judge is saying, I better do something because if this lady get for, to get to do what she needs, because she's trying to get justice. Otherwise, I'm gonna be beaten black and blue by her pounding. Is what he's saying. Yeah. Um, I kind of laughed when I was reading it because because it was almost like him saying, everywhere I turn, early in the morning she there, late night she there. I'm trying to go get a bite for lunch, and she there. I can't go to the men's room. She there. Everywhere I turn around, she's there asking me to. I, I'm tired of this woman. Every time I turn around, she's right. Because, again, she kept coming. She kept coming. She was persistent. She was persistent in him. The judge says, I'm going to grant her her request because she is going to wear me out. Yeah. And so I, I laughed, and I thought, okay, he's worried about him, her being, him being busted in the eye. Like, I wish I was him like Anyway, so she's bugging him, get on his nerve. She's about on his 73rd nerve, and he can't take it. So he now says, I will, okay, verse 5, yeah, verse 5, yet because this, this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming, she weary me. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I was looking at the clock. Y'all can see. And, it, and I'm sorry, you all. They kind of telling me, time's up. I'm just real. This is what it is. I'm sorry. My time is up. Okay, and so we're going to have to stop there. Okay, so just keep in mind, the lady kept going. Uh, she was persistent. She was persistent uh, in her coming because she knew she, she needed something. He was the one who could give her what she needed. She said, so I'm going to the judge who can do it. although knowing he had no regards for man he didn't fear God but he then gives in to her although his reasoning for giving is not the right is not the right reason so we got to pick up there we got to pick up there next week to kind of finish yeah I have to fill in exactly why and how come and the rest of that and so it gets good 
just don't rem just remember you must be persistent we got to keep going to God again and again because when we pray prayer will get us there we look at now at the example of what will happen when we persistently go to God the one who knows us different than this unrighteous judge he is the judge he knows everything he already knows what we need what we what we want even before we go to him but he still says I need you to yes. pray Lord, again, I say thank you, God. Thank you for this time. Uh, Lord, thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for, um, thank you for your